fussing about Feste, vacillating about Viola and objectifying Olivia within Act 3, Scene 1 of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Let's study this scene in more detail. This is Schofield on Shakespeare. As ever with my Twelfth Night videos, you need to have read the scene in full before watching this video. So if you haven't read and thought a little about Act 3, Scene 1, go and do that now. Time for my brief summary of Act 3, Scene 1. Dear viewers, subscribers and most of all, pupils. The scene begins with a lively, pun-ridden exchange between Viola and Fester. Whilst the former is willing to play the straight man to unleash the latter's jokes and has the cash to pay for them, she is not averse to some of her own linguistic contortions. Alone on stage, Viola recognises the difficulty of Fester's chosen profession and praises him for his ability. Olivia enters the stage soon after Sir Toby and Sir Andrew, leaving Viola to launch hymns of highly elaborate praise, apparently aimed at persuading Olivia to finally take notice of Orsino's suit. As in Act 1, Scene 5, Olivia and Viola end up on stage alone together. The former first hints at, then explicitly reveals, her feelings for the latter. Olivia is seemingly turned on by Viola's refusals and fails to see through her enigmatic statements that such a love is impossible. Time for you to answer some questions, dear viewers and subscribers. The more you independently write and think about these questions, the better. This video will resume in five seconds time, so press pause now to write your responses. Question 1. Explore the importance of duality in this scene and the play so far. Hmm. Should we just have a very quick, basic definition of duality? Well, fairly obviously, it is the state of combining two different things. There's a number of different ways of looking at this. Let's start by looking at the role played by duality of language in this scene. From the very beginning of Act 3, Scene 1, and arguably the very beginning of any Shakespearean comedy, we can see the duality of language. The preposition by is used by Viola in terms of making your living from. She is asking the polite question as to whether Fester earns his living from his music and drum playing. This is a reasonable question. We have seen in Act 2, Scene 3, how much Sir Andrew and Sir Toby enjoy his songs, whilst in Act 2, Scene 4, Orsina was desperate to get him back to re-sing his popular dirge, Come Away, Come Away, Death. Festen knows that this is what Viola is asking, yet his job, and presumably his hobby as well, is to look for every opportunity to play with language and to answer innocuous statements or questions in an unexpected way. Thus he uses another meaning of the preposition by in his response, meaning next to or at the side of. This change of meaning, this deliberate misuse of the dualities of language, results in a very different kind of communication. The exchange becomes about playing with different meanings of individual words, rather than supplying literal answers to preceding utter utterances. Viola never gets an answer as to whether Fester gets sufficient dosh from his music-making endeavours. Perhaps he does, judging by his successful acquisition of money from Viola herself in the same scene. However, her own willingness to out him as someone who toys with individual words rather than responds to meanings originally intended highlights her own agility and intelligence. 
you can see by the additional line now on screen that Viola is sharp enough to use her own examples to highlight the absurdity of Festa's twisting of her language. She uses the duality of the phrasal verb lie by, which can mean both sleeping next to and being situated adjacent to, to explicitly show the deliberate, absurd unreliability of Festa's use of language. Using his logic and linguistic practice, she argues, you could just as well inappropriately couple kings and beggars, or churches and drums. Fester doesn't dispute Viola's interpretation, but uses it to reflect on the slippery duality, or rather the potential disingenuous multiplicity of language, in a certain gloved hand, belonging to anyone other than Sir Andrew or Malvolio, it can be so easy to distort its meaning inside out. Returning again to the question, how important then is this duality of language in the scene and the play as a whole? What is the effect of the more intelligent characters having so much fun playing with puns? Well, on stage it creates a sparky, lively atmosphere in some ways similar to a game show. Who can accrue the most points with their responses? Who's at the top of the league table? Who wants to be? However, later events in the play, notably both Malvolio and Sir Andrew's humiliating exits, might suggest the unhealthiness of this us and them situation, with us being those who can play with language and them being those who can't, i.e. Sir Andrew, or can't or won't, Malvolio. How comfortable are we as an audience with this hierarchy in which those who are wits ultimately flourish and those who are less adept are demeaned? Or is this just true to life? But this question about duality clearly doesn't just apply to language. Once again, we see the problematic nature of role playing, of hiding your true self from others. Of course, this is seen in Cesario Viola in this scene, but arguably with Olivia too. A key section of the scene which highlights the unintended consequences of Viola's duality, i.e. the fact that she is a woman, Viola, but others think she is a young man, Cesario, is shown on screen now. Before we discuss this in more detail, Let's see how this plays out in the 1970 TV production of the play, directed by John Sichel. Stay. I prithee, tell me what thou thinkst of me. That you do think you are not what you are. If I think so, I think the same of you. Then think you right. I am not what I am. I would you were as I would have you be. Would it be better, madam, than I am? I wish it might, for now I am your fool. <laughs> Cesario, by the roses of the spring, by maidhood, honour, truth and everything, I love thee so, the more go all thy pride, nor wit nor reason can my passion hide. Do not extort thy reasons from this clause, for that I woo thou therefore hast no cause. What is clear from this exchange is that Viola's adoption of her disguise has created confusion, not only about her own identity, but Olivia's as well. This is made clear by the highlighted utterance on screen now. Olivia thinks she is someone in love with a man, and the fact that Cesario is not a man means that she isn't the personal lover she thinks she is. Everything is based on an illusion, albeit a temporarily delightful one. Olivia's reply strikes me as more akin to so many of Sir Andrew's utterances towards Sir Toby than anything more profound. Just as Sir Andrew frequently parrots his apparent friend of the bosom, here Olivia is so in love with Cesario and so keen for this love to be reciprocated that she wants to show that she shares his feelings and opinions, whatever they are, or however poorly she understands them. Whereas Sir Andrew's aping stems from a woeful lack of intellect and imagination, Olivia's stems from desperate love. Either way, Olivia's echoing lines tease up Viola and the audience brilliantly for another dramatic irony inspired dark laugh. Viola is most certainly not what she seems as she is disguised as Cesario, the persona which virtually everyone in Illyria finds so attractive. 
Returning more specifically to the question, Viola's duality in this scene encourages us to think more explicitly about our identities. The modern audience in particular may question the necessity of Viola's disguise causing so much angst. Surely our gender is only one part of our identity, which needn't get in the way if you genuinely love and care about someone. Of course, at this stage in the play, Viola isn't just disguising her gender, but given previous confident proclamations about her own social class, in Act 1, Scene 5, she tells Olivia that she is a gentleman, it does seem as though this issue, the fact that women loving and marrying other women would not have been contemplated, is the one which troubles her more than any other. So Viola's duality provokes this intense exchange about identity, and it is tempting to develop further Viola's idea that Olivia doesn't know what she is. Remember, she has previously declared to Valentine in Act 1, Scene 1 that she will remain veiled for seven years to mourn her brother. And now, just days later, she is doing the complete opposite and is about to declare love to someone who apparently is a mere page. Is Shakespeare highlighting here the potential for disguise and different identities within all of us? Is Viola's own explicit disguise just a catalyst of thinking more generally about the faces we present to the world and the extent to which these are authentic to our inner selves? Is identity not as fixed as we might like to believe? Indeed, intertextual readers are likely to recall Iago's identical words from Act 1, Scene 1 of Othello. Iago is emphatically not the honest Iago which others like to call him. He is bitter after being passed over for promotion and becomes hell-bent on causing Othello as much harm as possible. On the surface, there are a few similarities b between Viola and Iago. One is kind and sensitive, the other manipulative and malign. However, their sharing of this line gives an insight into just how difficult it can be to really gauge the true identities of others, what they are really like. Shakespeare seems to be suggesting just how complex human identities can be. We are capable of adapting not just dual roles, but multiple ones. Within this web, there is clear the, clearly the potential for this inability to hold genuine insight into other human identities to cause great harm. Hence the deaths of Desdemona and Othello in the tragedy, and here, the hurt and frustration experienced by Olivia. Time for question two. Read, reread Act Two, Scene Two of Romeo and Juliet. What similarities, differences can you identify between Juliet and Olivia? And what insight does that give us into the latter's behaviour in this scene? Let's start with a brief summary of Act 2, Scene 2 of Romeo and Juliet. It begins with a dreamy soliloquy from recently love-struck Romeo. He has managed to climb into Juliet's back garden and is looking up at her bedroom window. He uses conventional imagery to eulogise about her beauty. Fortunately for him, Juliet is not asleep. And even more fortunately for him, she begins to speak out loud without realising that he is present. She talks of her love for him and tries to argue away the thorny problem of him being a Capulet. Her family hate the Capulets more than anything in the world. Romeo spends some time listening to her declaring her love before revealing his presence. Juliet is first shocked and then delighted to hear his voice albeit worried about his safety. However, she tells Romeo of her embarrassment at being overheard revealing her feelings, and even offers to be contrary, should he feel the need to play the manly role as the wooer. The scene ends with Juliet suggesting that Romeo should go to the priest in the morning to arrange their marriage. So what insight can we glean into Act 3, Scene 1 of Twelfth Night by comparing Olivia to Juliet in this scene from Romeo and Juliet? Well, I'd like to start off by exploring Juliet's mortification at being overheard in more detail. She frets. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face, 
else would have made him blush but paint my cheek for that which thou hast heard me speak tonight. In other words, she's embarrassed. As a woman living in Shakespeare in England, it simply isn't the done thing to let a man know your feelings before he has declared his own hand. In a very similar way, Olivia in Twelfth Night confesses her embarrassment at her ring stunt. Referring to the moment she got Malvolio to return a ring which she had never given in the first place, she admits that this weak, impulsive act of deceit was wrong and worries what on earth Cesario would think of her after such a demeaning, strong hint of her feelings. She uses bear-baiting imagery to suggest that Cesario has been responsible, presumably through his Ariel-esque enchantment, for tying up her honour like a poor chained bear and causing her thoughts and doubts to torment and bait her. An initial contrast between Olivia and Juliet highlights the former's desperation. Whereas the latter can talk of simple maiden blushes, the former has to resort to violent imagery to somehow blame Cesario for her own feelings. Of course, given the total lack of reciprocity, it's perhaps no wonder that Olivia feels the need to use in more violent, fraught language. Within the same speech uttered by Juliet, what she goes on to suggest is interesting. In these lines, she shows an explicit understanding of the expected role-playing of men and women in courtship. Men expect women to put up a fight in the courtship, to make them work hard for their eventual marital conquest. The implication here is that men may not value women who are too keen or give in too easily. This comparison thus emphasises the extent to which Olivia is failing to follow expectations for her sex, or, put more positively, is attempting to subvert expectations to empower herself when, in Act 3, Scene 1, she openly declares her love. Perhaps before getting too carried away, we need to emphasise the differences in Olivia and Juliet's context. Juliet is 13, and at this stage in the play, a model, obedient daughter. We are not told Olivia's age, but it must be considerably older, as partly implied through the deaths of her father and brother and her authority within her household. She is also a countess, whereas Juliet is merely from a household alike in dignity to Romeo's family. Able to exert authority within her own household, and with no male paternal or fraternal figure to interfere or get in the way, is there any wonder that Olivia feels that if any woman can try to take the leading role in establishing a new relationship, it is her? That said, Juliet's offer, albeit a tongue-in-cheek one perhaps, to frown and be perverse, highlights the extent to which Olivia has been driven mad by Cesario. She knows that Really, she shouldn't be declaring her feelings so openly, or trying limply to put the blame on him, yet she cannot stop herself. The case of Juliet, however, does show fruitful possibilities in terms of manipulation. Following Romeo's wail about being so unsatisfied, she engineers the conversation around to marriage. I think this is quite clever. She has effectively subverted the rules for her gender by proposing marriage, although Romeo may be deluded into thinking that he is continuing to be the active, manly partner by having to arrange the time with the priest. So, the comparison between Twelfth Night and Romeo and Juliet shows that women can be successful in taking the lead in a relationship, the trouble in Twelfth Night is not just that the woman, Olivia, is insufficiently manipulative and comes across as too desperate, but far more importantly, the person she is in love with is a woman disguised as a man. Major problem. However, in a comedy, most major problems typically have happy resolutions. Hence Porter Williams Jr, within an essay entitled Mistakes in Twelfth Night and Their Resolution, can suggest that her humiliation paves the way, whether she realises it or not, to a successful future marriage to Viola's twin brother. 
We'll talk more about this in a future video. But this is one way of trying to justify the fact that Olivia ultimately marries someone she barely knows. Go viewers, seek happy nights to happy days as much as is possible during these wretched coronavirus times. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, encouraging you to think more closely about Act 3, Scene 1 from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Many thanks for watching.